Good evening. How are you guys doing? Oh. You sound like you were having fun in here. I'm good. My name is Stacy Wilson Hunt, and I'm so honored to be here tonight to celebrate this woman who is not only a gifted stand up performer, but just a really cool, smart woman. And we need to support more of those in our lives, don't we? Yes. So without further ado, I'm going to bring to the stage Eliza. Come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Standy, no. That's Thank you. Kind of Not amazing. from everyone, but <laughs> some brave souls in the back. Only eight people total. We will remember who you are. Remember that number. So, so obviously they love the show. Uh, what does it mean to you to hear this rapturous laughter coming from this room? I thought it was all the soundtrack from the, <laughs> not soundtrack, but for the thing, and then I came in and watched for a little bit. It's surreal. Like, I'm very used to an audience laughing, obviously, but <laughs> in a screening setting, because the energy isn't the same as a live performing, so it was just kind of otherworldly. Like, it was my first time watching people watch me, so that was really cool. I was like, should I cry? No. <laughs> No, it's not that. We'll get to Weird. some tears later. I have some very hard-hitting questions for you. <laughs> okay. Um, awesome. <laughs> well, I, I, I love to ask funny people, uh, when was the first time you knew you were funny? Do you remember the moment where you realized it? No. <laughs> I, does anybody have an answer like Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Really? Yep, for sure. I think that's fabricated. <laughs> I do. Like, I said something and my teacher laughed and I realized... No, I'm Literally not many, many people say that. Like, I was in class and I made a joke. They could be lying to me. I don't know. Uh, I only know I what just, they tell me. Because th this answer, I guess... Some, like, sometimes when you are something... And this sounds so egotistical. Like, I just was always funny. But, like, sometimes when you are something... And I, can't, I couldn't tell you what made me want to make people laugh other than this intrinsic desire to do so. Um, my parents are funny and getting a laugh was always the thing that was a priority over absorbing information, over listening, over <laughs> class projects. It was always about making the teachers laugh. There's two kinds of teachers, the kind that think you're hilarious and the kind that like really don't like <laughs> that you're doing that. And then in your, the back of your mind, you're like, well, I'm smarter than you anyway. Um, <laughs> So it was always that, and I also think, and I wrote about this like a little bit in my book, um, it was, I always feel like little girls weren't really given permission to laugh and be funny. So you'd find like a couple girls that would laugh, and you'd be like, you be my friend, you laugh at me, and this is funny. But it was boys that always laughed. Well, the idea of the class clown was always the boy. Yeah, uh, it was, and I always sort of was that, and even in high school, uh, we split it, me and Andy Arizosa split the title. <laughs> <laughs> of like class clowns we were both funny we were both in the improv troupe together I also went to a very small school so it's so whatever but that was always my thing I don't remember the first laugh but I remember always feeling oddly left out and I always felt like I'm funny why aren't I more popular <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I think being funny comes with the sense of thinking that you kind of know better than other people even as a kid, like arguing with refs at my YMCA ba CIA basketball game, like <laughs> stupid, like shut up kid. But right. you can't not have a little bit of an ego and do this, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't think I'm better than anyone, but like growing up, you're kind of... But you had a sense of self early on. Sense of self early on yeah. and how that was forged. I mean, we can we could ha hypothesize all kinds of things. <laughs> your parents were divorced or you right. left your school or whatever, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Strength just... At beach because there was no other option and it's not like I had that heart of a life but you know shitty things happen and you kind of decide the person you want to become sure humor helps a lot it does yeah yeah and who yeah. were your comedy role models when you were younger I didn't you know I I think a lot of times when you have um an older sibling or your dad is in the house and he's showing you what you should watch like there's certain <laughs> movies you know you get things like that um and I my parents were divorced and so it was just me uh and my mom you know working mom for a while and doing everything she could but it was me cobbling together uh a comedy education and for me it was a lot of sketch shows and cartoons so the voices you know like even today if I hear a noise, I'll be like, like I'll do it back. <laughs> if you have an accent, I'll mimic it back and it's not 
like you're from another country that's funny it's i'm like logging it in my brain my brother makes noises too um <laughs> We both do. You do a lot of voices in the special. Yeah, it's because like, I loved yeah. cartoons yeah. and I loved like whimsical things and sketch comedy was a big thing. So in Living Color oh, and yes. yeah. I was a little young for the state, but I watched it not knowing what it was, but I was drawn to it. Isn't it amazing now when you revisit what yeah. they were doing in 93 or whatever? That was? And what was considered edgy. I mean, in Living Color was edgy, never to be replicated. Like that no. show was the best and no. Kids in the Hall was huge for me. Huge. And in Living Color, of course, oh, not Living Color, Saturday Night Live, of course. So it was that and, uh, and I guess a lot of sitcoms. Hmm. Um, and so, it, and it was just not necessarily, and you know, of course I watched like Wayne's World and stuff, but it was cobbling together whatever you could kind of get your hands on. I listened to a lot of Monty Python and it was like kind of whatever I caught in my baleen, <laughs> like whatever <laughs> got sifted through is what became a uh, part of what informed me. You actively were gathering this sort of intellectual property and kind of just storing active it. is in that like that's what i wanted to watch like right. martin was a big show so i watched martin you know right. um i didn't watch probably like dawson's krieger and like that it was always about <laughs> like funny things that were on the air i don't know and funny people mm -hmm. and of course there was a lot of men growing up but there were like the women of snl like sherry o'terry mm. fucking set a oh tone God, she's so good well she set a tone for yeah. the way that we delivered jokes for about a decade mm -hmm. as well as Jim Carrey like there are some people uh Chris Farley too that informed language patterns mm -hmm. um so I don't know there's and Phil Hartman too for yeah. sure that yeah. voice like yeah. we all do it there's and certain as a voice actor too he was just everything for sure Simpsons yeah. all that stuff so yeah. you know it was just kind of whatever came into my path was what informed it hmm. yeah and when was the first time you performed to an audience and you felt wow I really I have an aptitude for this um for stand up or just in in any capacity uh in school <laughs> acting uh you said you were in a sketch group in school yeah but that's like who cares like it was like my sketch like hey high care that's no, why no, we're here no it's like you're you're like sketch uh, you're sorry it was an improv troupe um i remember i did i went to a performing arts camp uh when i was like 13 and we did hello dolly at the jcc <laughs> See, I knew we were going to get into this kind of story. But exactly. I remember I got the part and I was like one of the older kids there and like I still didn't get the part of Dolly and I'm like, this is bullshit. Like, <laughs> like who are you giving this to? Uh, and they gave me the part of like cook number one. Like that many kids were going out at this like Jewish creative arts camp <laughs> and I hammed it up and like tried to steal the scene. Like I, she and Horace Vandergelt, they were all in front and I was in the back just like flipping things and... <laughs> It's a community theater production for a camp. And I remember getting laughs from that. And it kind of set a legacy for me always getting very small parts in productions. I got Lady in the Balcony, num I got Lady in the Balcony twice in our town. One time I did it at camp and then I <laughs> came to high school and they were like, we're doing our town. And I was like, oh, I know I'm gonna play the lead, Emily. And they're like, Lady in the Balcony. I was like, great. I already know the one line. What was the line? Do you still remember? Yes. Is there much culture in Grover's Corners? <laughs> that was it. Amazing. <laughs> but I think, yeah, like, seventh grade, I went out for something, and I couldn't do the play because I had really bad, uh, a really bad math GPA. And, like, I never got to be the star of anything. And so you find ways around it. You get to do sketch, or you get to do improv, but I never... It was never going to be easy for me. Like, no one ever was ever going to be like, you, you get up, you go. So I think stand-up found its way to me because it really is about your own merit and it is about you take all the risk and reward by yourself. Well, because you're writing your own material too. Absolutely. You're not having to rely on other people saying, okay, we're going to give you this many lines. We're de you know, saying that you're good enough. You just decide you're good enough. Absolutely. The audience does. Yeah. I mean, you decide first, then the audience. And uh, in college, I was in a sketch troupe and that was great. But there was part of me that like clicked and I was like, I remembered writing a lot of sketches and I remember being told by another girl like well I don't write and I was like okay well why do I, I don't want to write for you <laughs> like why do you get to be the main girl in it like you know and after college I was like I can do this on my own so not that sketch isn't powerful and didn't like raise me but I was like I can do this as a monologue it doesn't have to be a dialogue and I went in that direction and when was the first stand-up performance that you gave where you thought, wow, I, I killed it, and you wrote material that you were proud of, and it, and it worked in the room? This is such a weird answer, but I did a program called Semester at Sea, my last, uh, yeah? Who said how nice? 
Did you, did you hear it? No. Oh, but you heard of it. Cool. Um, <laughs> it was like an audible, oh, nice. I was like, Sasser, me too. Sans first semester. Uh, but they had like an open mic night, like a coffee house, so people could come with their guitars or do your like, slam poetry or whatever. And I took a couple of things that I had written from a one-man show in college, and then I started observing things around the ship, and mainly I was observing the way that men and women interacted. I was friends with these like three really good looking guys who went to ASU, obviously they went to ASU. <laughs> and I remember thinking there's no way they're gonna be attracted to me, but I was so attracted to making them laugh because that's almost, it, it, it's up there with me with flirting. Like it's, I'm like, I'm getting a laugh. Like I'm still stimulating a response from you. And they thought I was the funny girl and it kind of bought me this pass to hang out with them. So it's like, well, if I am not going to sleep with them, I can at least be around them, which is like what a lot of guys do. Yeah. <laughs> could, yes, could I have like randomly had drunken sex? Maybe, but that's like so not what I wanted. Um, it is what I wanted. That's a lie. <laughs> it's a lie! And, but I would sit in their room. I wrote this about this in my book, so I'm sorry if this is repetitive for anyone, but I would sit in their room and we would watch uh, like Will Ferrell, uh, SNL, DVDs and Family Guy and I would watch as girl after girl, adorable girl after girl would come in and they would each take their shot at getting an invite to stay in the room. And that's where my girl voice came from because every girl, and it's not like I was better than them. I was just sitting there like, I'm in the club. I don't know if you can come in. It's not my room. And <laughs> these beautiful girls were trying so hard to be accepted by these guys who kind of had the run of the place and everything was like, did I leave a thumb drive in here? Did I leave my book in here? I'm like, Hugger, you know you didn't leave your book in here. <laughs> but, thumb drive, that's how old I am. But it was this attempt to just get in there and like- Being asked by Johnny Carson to sit on the couch. Kind of, and then like show like your thong, like a little mat. And that's where it came from. So I would do, I would talk about that on stage and no, every girl sees themselves in it, but at the same time is like, that's not me, that's her. But it's like, it's us. We all do it. And that's sort of where that came from. And then I, a whole career <laughs> followed that one inkling. And when did you commit to doing this full time? Did you have the sort of dreaded day job and you did stand up at night? Or did you just sort of throw yourself into it right away? Uh, I moved to Los Angeles. I did, I don't know if anyone here went to Emerson, but I did the um, one clap. Great. <laughs> one sad person running the camera. I was like, Uh, they have an LA program that you can do here and I did that and I, I, I just got a job. Like the second school was over, I got a job. I like wormed my way into an apartment. I like, I got ready for life. I like negotiated with the landlord. I, she was like, I don't know. And I was like, look, you're Jewish, I'm Jewish. I'm gonna pay, I pro just be cool. And I found like a roommate and I, I got a job, like just a regular job as like an assistant at like a creative agency and and, and at night I would go and I would do stand up and there's something very freeing about when you're in your 20s first of all you have so much energy like you're just going and you're a wreck and you're sweaty every picture of me like 27 and under I'm just like sweaty like at a bar like I'm doing it like you're just <laughs> and you're fine because you've got the collagen and the energy and you can get up at 9 a.m. and schlep an hour sorry 8 a.m to the west side for your job and then go get hammered that night and it's fine and you look fine and everything's beautiful. And so I was doing that and doing stand up at night and without, so the, the beauty part is when you, when no one tells you no, and I hear this from a lot of filmmakers, like no one told me I couldn't. So I just did. Um, when no one tells you no, and there's no real roadmap stand up is however you want to get there. You just kind of go in that direction. And I just, I don't know if I'm a smart if I'm good at working smart, but I know I'm really good at working hard. And so I would just book shows. I would drive to San Diego if they would give me more stage time. I'd drive back home. I'd do my gig. I'd get up. I would ask other comics who were like bigger if I could design their flyers for their shows, hoping that I could be like, and can I add my name to it? <laughs> and then I started running my own room, even though, and I'll tell you where it was. It was the Cat Club, which is now Rock and Riley. Uh, on Sunset and I went over to the owner and I was like and I this is my advice for any comic I was like what night can I do a show here and he's like Tuesday I'm like yeah because everyone goes out on a Tuesday <laughs> and they would charge me they keep all the money they were like you have to give us at least $300 so I made no money and that was like a made-up rule obviously <laughs> uh, but it was a show that I had so I could trade with other comics and be like I got a show want to trade spots 
and I would just do them and do them shows over and over. The improv made me a regular, so I would, this is a long answer, but this is the answer. Uh, I would go and feature for comics. Honestly, it was black comics. Uh, Mark Curry, I got to do, he will never remember me. I got to do a weekend with him at like Ontario Improv, and then I won like a MySpace, so you think you're funny. <laughs> you guys remember my Uh And I got to open for like Bruce Bruce. Oh, I love Bruce Bruce. Right, like what, it was so random. Um, and Bill Bellamy, I got to open for him once. Uh, the comedy store made me a regular. Like, you kind of start to, like, make your little way. And then three years in, so I had my day job. And then I, I remember I got asked to do a military tour. Not with the USO, but people get to do them all the time. You know, it doesn't have to be USO. And we went to, like, Singapore. And my boss gave me two weeks off to go do it. And that was, like, my first chance. We went to Diego Garcia, teeny tiny island in the middle of nowhere, Singapore and Guam. And I came back, and I remember I... I don't remember exactly when, but I called my mom and I was like, I'm going to quit this job. I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to try to do, I'm going to be funny full time. Can I borrow a thousand dollars so I can buy a computer? And I actually paid her back unlike the rest of my life, but I did pay her back for that. And I got a job writing. There was a website called heavy.com, which I think still exists, but not as what it is. And I got a job writing for a girl that had like a show and I wrote the whole show and they paid me $600 a week and I was like this is so much money how will I ever spend it <laughs> and I started right like little thing you pe you cobble together a tiny little existence and then the charm dancer is three years in I auditioned for last comic standing and I won it and that gave me the opportunity to be a headliner that show, and I'm not like in love with talking about it or anything, and I, I certainly don't walk into a room like, guess who's here, 2008 winner, line up for autographs. <laughs> but that show gives you the opportunity to have a career. It really is a sink or swim kind of moment. And so I took my bag, and a year later I got a dog, <laughs> and we just went on the road. And so I had a living, but it was like the inklings of a career. And I just kept built, chipping away at each city until it's very inspiring here. honestly oh, I mean, all that hard work and focus i think it's kind of rare for someone that young to really just dive in and not sort of hem and haw about how hard it is and yeah and i think also you know i think you're either you either have work ethic or you don't i went to a very demanding high school so i had like a billion hours of homework a night so the idea of working hard my parents worked hard my dad was like a sales rep forever and mm. There's just, I'm really, and even when I played sports, like what I lacked in skill, I made up for with like positive attitude and grit hmm. and like a lot of red flags thrown. But <laughs> <laughs> there's always that. If you're willing to do the work, it, hmm. you can compensate for almost anything. Hmm. That is very true. And Sorry, now we come to. so long. No, it's so long. It was very informative. Okay. That's all we it could be longer. I have like more to say. But <laughs> no, I no, no. We're good. Okay. We're good. So Elder Millennial, congratulations. It's Thank such you. a special show. Oh my gosh, yes. thank you. <laughs> thank you, that's so crazy. I was so excited to come here tonight. I was like, I don't have to do stand-up. I guess it's just like, not. I can wear a dress and be a person. <laughs> you can be a person. This is cool. And when you sat down to write this show, what were you trying to tell with this material that you hadn't told before? What was new in your life and what was, because obviously you we touch on the relationship stuff and male, female dynamics and et cetera. Yeah. But what was new about this version of yourself? Well, I will say this. Um, I didn't sit down to write it. I, I think that you're just saying, but I, I don't write uh, at a desk. I don't write things down. This is all from memory and this is all a combination. This is, I'm sorry, uh, accumulation of hours and hours nice move asshole hours <laughs> is it yours greg <laughs> it's like my husband's phone no it's not i don't know who that is um hours and hours of it's like an athlete it's so much practice it's hours and hours and weeks and weeks and months on the road polishing it so you did not write this down like no. in your computer this is not i can't find this in your laptop like uh -uh. this these jokes no whoa Wow. <laughs> but I, I actually don't know if I'd be alone in that. I, th I, uh, I don't know. I think a lot of comics might be like that. Really? I'm just, I'm not trying to be like, I'm so, I'm the only one that does it this way. <laughs> but that is a proprietary is, that, blend. That's surprising. I mean, cause it's so, it feels so like a performance, a one woman show. It feels very theatrical. Practice. Well, practice. Wow. Uh, it's very cool. Thank you. But that also, you know, I did confirm kills and that was the last special and I was so proud of it because it was so strong and it was 
an evolution. It was a spot in an evolution. You know, the last two specials were a 20-something girl talking about going out and drinking, as you should be concerned with those things. I was I, I like to think I'm always saying the right thing at the right time. Um, and I was... I was trying to be authentic and talk about my experience, you know, and that's what I was talking about, like guys and girls and women's bathrooms and how we feel, you know, because that's authentic to me and that's what's making my world go round. And then with confirmed kills, it got a little bit more. This is before Me Too and all that stuff, but I started to get, I don't know, I almost felt like I had a license to say something because I'm like, well, I'm over 30 now and actually some of this is bullshit and here's what I feel. And then with this one, I don't set out, I guess, to... I think that that's manipulative. Um, this is not crapping on your question or anything, but you know, it's like I'm setting out to say something like so I can market it this way. It's what's in your heart, and these things come out, and weeks and months of doing it, and you start to be f f more and more firmly planted in what you feel and what you think. And then I got engaged, so that informed the beginning of it, and that informed the whole dress bit. Like, uh, you know, you st I start to look at everything through this lens of I can't be the only one feeling this way. This is bullshit that I have to feel this way. Wait a second. If I'm feeling this way, they must be feeling this way. And there's a power in that, in that acknowledgement that we're not alone. Like you're special, you're a unique flower, but like we have the same thoughts, you know? Um, and so, and there was, you know, here I am at, I shot it on my birthday. So I was 34. Yeah. Um, and I felt th that I had the license to be like, no, like this is how I feel. I'm not backing down or apologizing because I'm not, and this is not to, you know, take this away from anyone who's younger. I'm a woman now. I'm not some girl bad hair extensions like running around which I have um they were fine um I felt like a little I felt unshakable and I honestly from the bottom of my heart like I did confirm kills and I was like this is my opus like this is my my baby and the response was great and like you see an uptick in ticket sales I I didn't expect the a response to this because you go through your career and life you're trying so hard and people are like oh you're a funny female comedian who are you and you're trying and then all of a sudden this drops and people like this is a room full of people and none of you look alike like you're all so different and it's so humbling because like you don't matter for the longest time and you think you're doing everything in a vacuum and I'm not saying that this is like winning like a Nobel Peace Prize or anything but I'm so used to just putting my head down and working and knowing that nothing's gonna move the needle. And while this hasn't made me like a major celebrity or anything, to get a response like the one that you always wanted to finally get it, and then you finally get it and you're like, oh, okay, cool. Um, I wasn't ready to put under a microscope. I hope I answer everything okay. Like you wait for it and wait for it and then you get it and it was a surprise. Like I wasn't surprised that I put a quality product out there. I was surprised that people finally paid attention. And also, you speak to the diversity of this room, the fact that all these people could find humor and, and have these things resonate with them. Yeah. Clearly, I mean, that is comedy. <laughs> and yeah. good comedy is something that, you know, I might not have anything in common with Bruce Bruce, but he's hilarious. Right. And I laugh at him because he has a way of delivering reality that I can connect to in some way. What if you were like the biggest Bruce Bruce fan? And I actually like kind of am. Him? Okay. <laughs> um, I always feel that you laugh at things for two reasons. You laugh at it uh, because it's so relatable and you're like, oh my God, she sees me. How is she in my mind? Or it's so insane. <laughs> you can't believe somebody's saying that and you never thought to laugh at it. But at the end of the day, we all want to be seen, you know, whether it's by the parent that ignores you or the person that you love or whatever society, wherever society like skipped a beat and you feel that you're not being seen. And for this special I wanted women in particular, of course, I want people to relate to this, to feel seen. I wanted them to watch it and think like, oh my God, somebody else understands how horrible I feel and how insane I feel. And to like let you know that like, no, you, you're not wrong and you're not insane and it's okay. And I think that's what we all want is to be understood and seen, right? So that's like the sad part. <laughs> <laughs> And do you have a f favorite part of this performance? For me, it's the dog stuff. Um, Who's the baby? The the ba like I got home after I I watched this on my phone at the Portland airport a couple days ago, and I saw my dog. I instantly started to feel sorry for him because he did not know what was coming to him. 
every time he doesn't know. <laughs> he does not know. And that's why we love him because they're so dumb and sweet. They have no, they just have no idea. They have no idea. The, the <laughs> Stockholm syndrome that they have. What's interesting, like I, th- the jokes that you see on here are now so different uh, because I've been doing this special since February. And so that was over six months ago. So now the delivery is different. The tags are different. There's new jokes in. I don't even do who's the baby because it's such an exhausting bit. Um, a lot of them are like big set pieces that if you're just like, I'm tired. It's 11 o'clock. I've been on stage for an hour and I, I can't do who's the baby. Um, uh, same with like the whole scrotum thing. I got tired of saying scrotum. <laughs> And then well, at the comedy store, like a lot of times in our lineup, I bring up Mark Marin, And so I would do the scrotum bit forever. And then he would always get on. Like we all have standard things we say about each other because we're always bringing each other up. And he would always make a joke about, he'd be like, all right, let's just come. Like, let's just relax a minute because I'm so energetic on stage. He's like, let's just take it down a notch. And then he'd be like, wow, Liza, scrot shaming. Or maybe it was Neil Brennan. One of them talks about scrot. It was Neil Brennan, scrot shaming. And I think part of me was like, I don't want to shame anyone's scrotum. I don't want to do this joke. Um, <laughs> so, but fa- your, your question was favorite part. I like doing the peacock sound. <laughs> like on a, I, I enjoy the noise uh, on a personal note, I will tell you. And if anybody like religiously follows me on Instagram, you'll know this. I would even do it right now, but um, I have a joke about Channing Tatum in there. Like I use him as a tag. I also had him in Confirmed Kills. Um, I'm married and my, I love my husband, but whatever. And so... <laughs> And he's here, and he's totally very supportive. Channing Tatum sent me a direct message the other day. Because <gasps> oh, my God. <laughs> because he watched the special, and he was a fan, and it's in my stories. I screamed so loud. We're talking, like, 1960s, your mom seeing the Beatles for the first time screaming. <laughs> that I, like, I wrecked my voice. So these past two shows in Canada this weekend, I was just, like, sucking on lozenges, drinking tea, And I was like, how am I going to do the peacock? So, like, you find, like, a different register, but... What did he say in his note? This is what we need to know. Uh, No, he just, he made a reference to the whole, I have a whole bit about the gazelle and how men prefer, um, I guess I like that joke a lot because it really makes a great biological point. It's a great visual, too. Thank you. It took so much (laughs) core energy to stand. It was very impressive. Yeah, those heels were really tall, and that room was very cold. Um... He made a joke. He was like, oh, I would love a strong, smart gazelle. And he, but he was sweet. He was like, but I'll be honest. I eventually get tired and I'd probably ask to be pointed in the direction of a limpy like, <laughs> gazelle. So it was very self-effacing. And he was like, I'm a fan. Keep doing it. And I was like, do you want tickets to my show at the Ace Theater? And then he was like, I don't know. Um, Aw, so. Channing. Um, I did have... I wanted to know how you chose your wardrobe because I, Ooh, great question. And, and normally I don't, <laughs> I try not to dwell on the way people are dressed because normally it really doesn't have any impact in my experience, but it's such a unique parent. It's like this very powerful yeah. ensemble. It's nautical. nautical. <laughs> it's sort of, it's all these things. That, and I wondered what went into that because backstage you said you wore a dress tonight, which is not something that you normally would wear on stage. So what went into those, the high-waisted pants, the sort of admiral pants and the, sure. you know. Full disclosure, and I said this to you backstage, mm-hmm. I wore a dress because we're going to dinner after this and like I wanted to eat. <laughs> and I couldn't wear like tight pants because then I'd be at dinner uncomfortable and like that's your body's way of saying like slow down, but like I didn't want to hear that message. <laughs> so I just wore a dress and I was just like, let it all Always out. be comfortable no matter what. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> I do wear sweatpants most of the time. Like, I am the girl that, like, I don't know if anybody was like this in school. Like, I was the girl that stayed in her jersey, like, hours after the game. So, like, I worked out at, like, 10 and, like, at, like, 6 o'clock. I was like, I'll take off these clothes. So, I'm a garbage pile. Um, okay, so you said, you know, the outfit doesn't go into your experience, which is a very feminist, awesome thing to say, you know. But um, it does impact the way a lot of people uh, view something. I de- of course, you will get past it if the jokes are good you'll get over the initial shock of like, oh, a roll or a breast or a leg. You know, um, I like to not really, I try not to put that hurdle there uh, between me and the audience. Like I get in and I want to like start fucking. Like I want you to hear, (laughs) like I'm ready to go. I want you to hear my joke, sorry. Um, (laughs) Like I came to But I think about, and and I'll, sorry to interrupt, but I think about- You're talking about fucking? No, go ahead. I think about Sarah Silverman, the way she's dressed in some of her performances, and she'll have like the black tights and the cutoffs, and it's super just, cool. It, and, which is super cool, but it's also 
I think she's trying to be sort of asexual. She's trying to just be like, I don't want you to be thinking about the stuff I have under. It, it, it's tough. It's just very interesting. Because as choices. a woman, you yeah. you would like to not think about that, but it is a part of our experience. You have to think about it. Um, I am a very, I believe that who you are on stage is an extension of who you are in real life. I, If you catch me any night of the week at the store, like since getting married, like I've had some trouble with some of my jeans. So like sweatpants and like a t-shirt. I'm a big t-shirt wearer, whatever. But for this or like for TV, like it's a nice thing and you want, you you have this opportunity to dress a little bit uh, more adventurous than you would because that audience is yours. Like you're not having to win them. Like they came for you. So it's not like a night in the main room where you're like, I hope some of you, I hope not all of you are here to see Joe Rogan and I hope that you're <laughs> on my side. Um, so that, so we did it on a ship and I went to this amazing stylist named Tara Swenson. I'm saying that right. I hope I'm saying that right. Okay, great. And so we're trying a lot of things. I don't love my thighs. I never wear a light color on them because it's just enough that like people are like, ooh, you're thick. And I'm like, I don't love that. Um, I'll be honest, as a white woman, it's not something that we're taught to like be okay with. Uh, and, and I don't want that to be a distraction. And so I always wear dark. Um, and so I wanted a dark pant. And if you do too tight, people are looking at the outline of your thigh. So if you have any meat on your leg, a pant that's like that looks the best. Tapers at the front. So we did a nautical pant. She had a couple different ones. And I tried it on and I was like, I don't love the lace up in the back, but this goes. And sometimes you do have to force yourself to step out of your sartorial confines that you've decided and be like, it's not, you're not going to look stupid. It's okay. And I was working out a lot for the special. So showing this part of my stomach I didn't feel was too revealing because it wasn't your belly button. You know, there, there actually just is a difference. Uh, it just is like, this is just a strip of skin, very bright skin. <laughs> the top, I think we like stole off an amateur gymnast. I don't know, but I wanted something tight cause it has to be, there's like, you know, if it's too tight, it looks weird, but if it's not tight enough, then you look bigger than you are. And then we had to wear a very, we, I had to wear a very high heel because those pants, you want to look long in them. Um, so that's what went into it is we found the pants and then it was just about finding the right top. It wasn't too cumbersome, but also showed off some strength. Um, and the hair was obviously all mine. It's like all my hair. <laughs> it's all my very real hair. So like, don't be jealous of how much, don't be weirded out that I have so much hair there and like not enough here. Like it's weird. <laughs> like just something, I changed it up. So I have a question and I want to get to the audience questions, but have you, have you watched Nanette, um, Hannah Gatsby's piece? Yeah. Okay. And I was in Montreal headlining the festival and she... She uh, got an award there. Well, right? yeah. They did like this like award ceremony, but I, my show was after her show in whatever theater we played, Olympia. So I caught, and it was the last performance she was doing. Right, she's retired it. Of that, because the Brits do it that way. They tore it and then they're done and they move on. <laughs> and I got to kind of sit to the, in the wings and watch like the last 15 minutes and it was so powerful and she walked off stage. I don't think she knows who I am, but I, and it was like emotional for her because this was the last time she'd run it and she's been raped and it's like a very serious thing. Yeah. And I was like the first person because we shared a green room just like standing there and I was just like, I better lean into it. I was like, I'm Eliza Schlesinger. That was amazing. And I hugged her and I'm sure she was like, who the fuck is this girl? <laughs> like I've got people no, to go see. she probably appreciated it. No, I'm she sure was she fine. Did. We took, I made her take a picture. Um... <laughs> She's but been on quite a whirlwind the last few months. Well, you know, it's yeah. it's rare to watch stand up and be floored. Mm -hmm. uh, I do it a lot. I watch a lot of people. It it really is hard to be good at it. And but do you think? And and when I I saw like a screener of it a few months ago, and I was just at my computer crying. I didn't I didn't know what to expect. I was really upset actually watching it and then I read all the there were like six thousand think pieces about this performance. This things. is the end of comedy with some of them. Do you think that what she did, even, even though she talked about being raped and all these horrible being attacked and she's realized she has autism. I mean, there's a lot of big stuff going on there. Do you think what she did was comedy or was it a performance or was it, does it matter? It doesn't I guess. matter. Okay. You, I mean, I joke about how my thing is a Ted talk, you know, like it's okay to take the audience on rides and then the payoff feels that much better. Right. It's okay to make a point. I mean, George Carlin, like that's a philosopher. Like, <laughs> right? What? Because a woman deigned to speak about a personal experience. Now we have to make a special category, just like we did for Black Panther. Like, why? Right. You know why? Put it, we love to put things in its special other box. And uh, I, I, so so it's on the stand up 
category on Netflix and it makes you feel something. Did you laugh at all? Yes. Okay. Think about all the shitty stand-up you watch where you don't laugh and it's still <laughs> called stand-up. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, because why not? Well, and I think you're in good company. I think you're... The, what, what, if I what just we trashed her. <laughs> well, I knew you weren't going to. That's why. But I did want to ask because a lot of people have sort of debated. But what is the merit of this thing the, that she did? The honest and, truth is, yeah. it does. Sh- it doesn't matter. Like, fine, call it something else. But just because you're not laughing the entire time at right. a dick joke, th- then that's not stand up. Like, whatever. <laughs> plenty of plenty of stand ups are smart and have something to say. Yeah. And she just evolved the art form in a different direction. And you still watched it. Wow. Well, Yes. <laughs> well, you fit in nicely with that as well. Uh, first question is from Carmen. Where is Carmen? Hi. Oh, hello, Hi, Carmen. Carmen. Um, Carmen asks a great question, which is, what do you know about the comedy business now that you wish you knew when you started? I just realized my legs are hairy. So I just kind of <laughs> I was like so excited about this slit. And then I was like looking at, I was like, oh, I missed all of it. I feel really bad about that. It's like, she's so bold now. Um... <laughs> That's a good, I can only answer like one quick thing. What's the abridged version of that? What do I, you know, um, I don't believe really in regrets and I'm happy to be where I am. And I think this moment is what it is because of perspective and a life learned, but it is a very, uh, I've given this answer before. So I think I'm going to stand by this answer. It's a very, um, lonely endeavor you will lose for anybody who's thinking about doing it. Like you will miss your friend's weddings. You will not be able to make it out on a Friday night because you have four sets. Um, You, it is a, it's a selfish endeavor. Of course you're doing charity events and you're making people feel good, but it is a solo sport and you are doing it by yourself. And um, I never got, that chance when I was younger, I, I was a store comic and an improv comic. So I know, I know a lot of people. And of course I have a lot of friends that do stand up, but I didn't ever get that chance to be like in the trenches opening for someone or like on the road with three other comics because I was headlining at such a young age. Nobody was kind enough to give me advice. Nobody, I didn't know any women. Um, there weren't a lot of women doing stand up, honestly, up until recently. And there still aren't that many that tour. And when I say tour, I mean like a real tour. Um, So I didn't have anyone to look up to. uh, And because I had won it, I wasn't subjected to some of the humiliation that a lot of younger girls are because I was a headliner. So there's no one like, there's not a guy above me being like, you got to sleep with me. I'm like, I already got my own stage time. So, (laughs) Um, So I guess I missed out on forming bonds with other comics. You know, you look at comics and they put their friends in movies. They work with their friends on shows. And it's because they came up from, you know, in Philly together, in Boston together. I came from Dallas, Texas. I went to school in Boston. I moved here. Yes, we did it. I, so I'm like a, I stand very proudly by Comedy Store and the improv, but, and those are my peers, but I don't, I never got a chance to solidify those bonds through anguish. Like I never had that time in the trenches. So, you know, sometimes I'll look at projects and I'll be like, why can't I be in that? And my manager's like, well, they're hiring their friends or it's all his friends or whatever. So of course you make your own art and you hire your friends. But uh, I guess I was always nice to people and I I can't change that, but it's a missed path, I guess. I, I wouldn't give up my path for anything, but there also seems to be such a premium placed on that, like dying up here, the show on Showtime, this long tradition of oh we're all miserable we're making no money but we hang out until 3 a.m smoking and drinking together every night and that becomes your family and I deliberately chose not to like I never I would do my spot ever since I was a kid like I did my spot and I left Mm -hmm. and there's this weird emphasis on like you got to hang out and it's like yeah to an extent but because I was always getting my spots it's it's my story is an outlier so I can't really give advice to other people you should the idea that you have to watch the other comics is so stupid like stay in support (laughs) Fuck that. Like, go to your other spot. Go write your shit. Like, stay in support. Give me a break. But there is a camaraderie. And I, do, I remember I watched the Joan Rivers documentary, and she talked about, I think it was a manager. I don't know if anybody, piece of work. And he was like an alcoholic or something, and he was like in and out of her life. And she had this thing she said. I remember watching it and crying because I was like, it was the first time that I saw in another woman, like, oh, my God, I feel the same way because I had no education from anyone 
but she was like, it's so, I'm paraphrasing it, but so sad because he's the only connection I have to that time in my life. And I have friends all over the country and all different comics, but like I have like a couple friends that remember like this certain booker, this horrible comic with the weird tooth, this <laughs> person who wreaked havoc, you know, like those, I cherish those relationships because then I get that chance to like, shit on people you know that's what we all love to do so it's like you served in the war together there's yeah. like this like real we like survived nostalgia. right steve yeah <laughs> so exactly um julia would like to know if you try your material at smaller venues when you're first starting out or Who's testing julia? it where is, is she? julia here oh she's over Hi. there uh absolutely and it continues you know you can catch me almost any night of the week at the comedy store uh in the original room or the main room uh i will do my friends shows small alt shows because that's where you can like get some work done um comedy store now is having such a moment that it's like packed to the gills on like a tuesday and i'm like come on like i some of these things don't have punchlines. like where do i get to get my reps in so uh smaller clubs when you start out because that's the only place you can work out and when i say smaller clubs smaller rooms fish taco places uh, upstairs at an acapulco which is now happy endings like whatever like you know you've been doing comedy a long time when you drive down any street in LA and you're like, I did a show there, I did a show there. That's now a CVS, I did a show there. So it's about just getting stage time wherever you can squirrel it away. And then now I still, if it's a good show, I'll jump on it. There's no ego attached to it or anything like that because you can learn something from every show. So yeah. And last question from Sean. Do you run into any challenges writing and performing comedy in today's PC slash social activism culture? Hard question, tough question. I really think, so I've just started writing like this new hour that I'm gonna do next. Uh, six months ago I started, but I started. Um, if you, I really think this goes, if you're really speaking from an authentic place, from a place of um, a life lived, from an ex a genuine experience, I don't think people can take it away from you. Um, we w people will fault you for for anything. Whatever you are, you people will find a way to make it not okay. Um, but if that is your experience, and you get at the end of the day, lay your head down and be like, "That is what happened to me. That is how I feel," and you're coming from a place of love, and it's not to say something mean to hurt someone, you know. And you can, as long as it's funny, you know. Honestly. Uh, a lot, that's the biggest issue we have, I think, in comedy. It's like, well, they said this offensive. Like, but it wasn't funny. It's not that it was offensive. It wasn't funny because there are offensive things that are hilarious. Or so, the, the offensive tweet from five years ago that's like, that was a joke. It's sure. Like, but it wasn't funny. Also, so why'd like, you say it? Leslie Jones said it great. She's like, we're comics. Like, let us do our job. I really do appreciate the perspective that I have gotten as I've grown as a woman on religion, on race, on gender, on all these things that we're constantly being educated on. And that's so important as a human to grow. Um, but even in the special, I have a line in there and I was talking about who's the baby. And I have this thing where I'm like talking about the idea that like your body will let you know if you want a kid and then I pause and I said by the way if you're a woman who doesn't want to have kids good news you're still a woman this joke's just not about you I did that because I knew if I didn't I would get women saying like how dare you write a joke about wanting a child when I don't we've gotten so sensitive that we are incapable of separating our own experiences from other people's experiences um, and that's a problem but I do think being a little bit more mindful of what might hurt people, that kills me to think that somebody would watch something and be and, and really be hurt by it. Um, the fact that you had the foresight and intellect to anticipate that and throw it out it. there and just say like, don't, no, 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 don't get your, you know, yeah. panties in a bunch. And like, in this new material, I start talking about that sort of splinter feminist culture. Does it have to be panties? Is that why you're laughing? <laughs> um, this idea that, women get very upset when you deign to be a different kind of woman than they want you to be and I'm just calling bullshit on all of it. Like, give it a rest. You don't like the joke? Fast forward. Don't watch. Like, I'm doing my job. We're all just trying to make people laugh. No one's trying to hurt anyone. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.